Good morning, everybody. I just want to thank everybody for coming out to this press conference we're having. The purpose of this press conference is to highlight the conditions that's happening. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Do we, do, are you, do we got a, do we got a, is there a phone that can record us? Yes, uh, no, no, I, I, no I'll, I'll, I'll just start over, ain't nothing. Do, we got the, All right. Okay. My name is um, J.O. Richardson. J.O. Richardson on Building It Together and CT Bell Fund. That way we can identify you. Definitely. All right. Um, okay. Do you need a spelling? Just J L R I J J E W U Richardson. R I C H A R D S O N. Yeah, everybody good? Right. Um, you give a three count? One, two, three. Right. Or three count? I just want to wait till this bike go by because the, the motor is loud. All right. That mic's not going to pick up anything around the sound. Oh, all right. So I, I, we can start now. We can start. One, two, three. Everybody, I just want to thank you for coming out to this event. Um, this event is to highlight what's happening in Cheshire Correctional and other facilities across the state. People are dying inside. People are being neglected from simple medical issues. And because of this is making it an unsafe environment for people behind the walls. You know, we have over, we have approximately 10,000 people in the state of Connecticut that are incarcerated in different facilities all across the state. In these facilities, people are dying at a record number. Since 2020, approximately 35 people died behind the walls. That's at this rate, an average of one person a month dies behind more than one person a month die behind the walls when our loved ones are sentenced to t um, serve time behind the walls and have to go to prison the sentence that they're serving they're not serving a death sentence and they're not serving a life sentence you know they're expecting to come home and have a chance to show and prove to themselves and their families that they've changed and they've bettered themselves but they're not being afforded that right because they're being neglected while they're behind the walls and some pe and people are not coming home to their loved ones. And there's a whole community of people that are suffering because they're expecting their loved ones to come home and for them to have a chance to rejoice with their loved ones' newfound, newfound ways of living their lives. But they're not afforded that because their loved ones die while they're behind the walls. So what we're doing is we are in conjunction with the community and families all across the state. What we're doing is we're asking the governor and the commissioner DOC to create a fund to support families that are behind, that are losing their loved ones behind the walls. We're asked, we have a petition going that have approximately 200 signatures and it's growing by the day. And we're asking community members all across the state to support what we're asking for and simply what we're asking for is to just for the state to come together with the community. We're mourning in silence because we have nowhere to, no, nobody else to go to and the state has responsibility because our people are in these facilities dying. And what we're doing is we're asking for the state to allocate at least $100,000 for each family that has a loved one that dies behind the walls. Things, and some of these costs could go towards the burial tombstones, um, giving the family help that they need, support. When our loved ones are sentenced, the DOC inherit the responsibility of feeding, clothing, and providing shelter for our loved ones. They also inherit the responsibility to keep our loved ones safe. If our loved ones are dying behind the walls, they're not safe and they're falling, sh and, and, and that's an issue. And we hope that we could come together and our request as a community for this fund won't go on deaf ears and 
the governor and the other elected officials will work together to bring this fund into a reality. So with that, I want to pass the mic to Tasha Blanco, who is also going to talk about one of the experiences of one of the people that died behind the walls and also talk about her experience and what she's viewed as working with this population. So today we're here again to talk about the inhumane conditions of our loved ones behind the walls. Just most recently we know that we lost our good brother and community member who lost his life while asking for help behind these walls. What we know is, is that our black and brown brothers are dying inside. We know that they're dying here at Cheshire, we know that they're dying at Osborne, and we know that they're dying at McDougal. We also know that we lost our sister Desiree Diaz at York Correctional Correctional Center, who passed away from medical neglect. What we'd like to share today is that not only was Desiree Diaz a woman who was getting her life together, she was also a mother, a sister, and a friend and did not deserve to die the way that she did. She was amazing and she was loving and devoted spouse. I would like to read a statement from a woman who would like to, to bring attention to her loved one who is behind the walls here at Cheshire today. I'm writing to share grave concerns about the health of my children's father and his fellow brethren housed in Cheshire Correctional Institution. His name is Sharif Nasheed, 217833, and he has almost since the beginning of his sentence been plagued by serious health concerns. They have gotten progressively worse over the years and been exaggerated by the COVID-19 protocols. Numerous requests to see the doctor to have medical staff at Cheshire adhere to the treatment plan created by providers upon his discharge from 10 to 11 stay at Yukon Medical Center one year ago have been and gone ignored. He was supposed to be seen and evaluated for various tests and when he requested attention be paid to his plan of care, he was silenced and viewed as a problem. Reports came from within Cheshire that correction officers required to wear masks were not wearing them correctly. If they were wearing them, they wear Cheshire they way, the way Cheshire chose to segregate its people was to continuously risk exposure to those non-infected by having them near and utilizing the same spaces as those who were being quarantined because they tested positive. A pass for a bottom bunk was suddenly not renewed as it had been since nearly the beginning of his sentence. At the beginning of this year, nearly one year after his hospitalization for complications of his liver, he shared with me that he had received news that his liver was failing. If receiving that news wasn't bad enough, it was not delivered by the doctor on site. The doctor's test results with the nurse who dispenses meds in the evening. Thankfully, she had some compassion and advised him to read the report privately and let her know if he needed anything explained. The time has come for Cheshire's medical staff, with few exceptions, to stop acting like they are not part of Connecticut's DOC. Additionally, the absolute lack of professionalism de demonstrated is demoralizing, dehumanizing, and unacceptable. The staff is not on site to levy additional punitive measures against our loved ones. The number of incarcerated individuals who have been extremely ill and who have died during this pandemic is an indictment on the Department of Corrections. That opportunities were not afforded to individuals who were immunocompromised to have been supervised. Compassionate release is unjust. The time is now for the administration and the staff at Cheshire CI and all of the DOC to do everything in its power to ensure the health and the safety of the people they are sworn to watch over. It would break the hearts of his mother and his children and all of his loved ones if Sharif's tireless advocacy on his own behalf resulted in the fate as 
Mr. Patrick Belcher, who recently passed away unnecessarily due to ongoing neglect of the basic humanity and proper health care at the hands of the officers and medical staff at Cheshire CI. Set them free. Anything else is a death sentence. There is still time to make this right. I read these, this statement and this testimony and to share of the people that have passed the importance of what we are doing to shine light on the medical neglect and the conditions on the inside. We know that people are hurting. We know our loved ones are hurting. We know that people are living in unjust conditions that are causing them to become sick. They are exposed to unclean water and mold. Thank you. I will now turn it over to Miss Greta. I'm sorry. It's Tasha Blanco, T A S H A B L A N C O, building it together. I would like to now introduce the family of Patrick Belcher. Of Patrick Belcher. Did he? My name is Rose Batchelor. I'm Patrick Leon Batchelor's mother. Can you remove your mask? Please? I'm Rose Batchelor. I'm Patrick Leon Batchelor's mother. And I'm Tisha, his cousin. So on behalf of the Bachelor and Spears family, um, I'm going to stand and say a couple of words for my cousin Rose because it is difficult at this time. Um, it's still fresh. It saddens me that a mother who was so scared of a child being on the street and think that he would get harmed on the street and thought he was a little safe behind the walls turns out to be a whole different situation. Never thought in a million years that she would lose her child behind bars. I'm a mother. I have a son. I have a husband from New Haven, Connecticut. It's scary out here in these streets and now it's getting to the point where it's scary in the jail where you can't even, you don't even know if your loved one's gonna make it home or not. And something should be done about that that's that is unacceptable how he was treated was unacceptable um knowing that a person is dealing with a mental illness or sickness they should have care around the clock care it should not have been no reason whatsoever that he was done the way he was done it's unacceptable and justice will be served thank you Hi, I'm Greta Johnson, and um, I'm here today. I'm speaking on the other end. I have a son that's here at this facility. Uh, it's, it's, it's so outrageous that young men and women are passing away inside of a facility where the state of Connecticut is placing them for safety. They're, they're actually putting these men and women in here and supposed to take care of them, do their time, be taken care of properly, medically wise. My son has chronic asthma. And for me to find out this past week after this happened to this young man, this baby that I knew when he was a little kid, that this 36 year old young man passed away inside of the, the prison, is it, it is unacceptable. Like how do you allow a place that's supposed to be secure and taking care of your, your loved one that sentence them to a a sentence and you do a sentence on top of a sentence inside of the prison itself there's no care they pay for medication you take on the responsibility but the people outside I am a mom and I've been taking care of my son for years in here I have to put money on his books if he don't have money on the books the first thing you say well I have a migraine I need medicine I have to pay for it so I have to make sure money's there what are they doing so I'm my thing is these people need to be called out on their, and be accountable and responsible. 
You can be irresponsible and turn a, a deaf ear and a blind eye to these things, but this should never have happened. This should not have happened. There are other things that were going on. And the, the bad thing is the fact that my son knew this young man and it hurt him to his heart to even hear about it. Though they're in different areas, they heard about it. Can you imagine the mental thing that these young men that are still here are going through? Watching this young man suffering and there was no help. What do you think will happen to them? What do you think their minds are telling them? I mean, we can take this thing and act like it's not happening or we can make some moves. And that's what we're here for today. We're here today to let you know that we say no, it cannot keep happening. We love our, our, our loved ones, regardless of what, what has been done, what you want to call them. When they're inside here, these bad parents that are taking care of these young men in here, because if it was on the street and you were a bad parent, they'll come and get your child and put it in a foster care. They're responsible. These people are responsible. And we need to find names, call them out. The governor, the mayors, everybody need to be responsible. And, you know, this is where it's at. I, and I'm done. Okay. I just saw a note to, um, first of all, I appreciate and thank everybody that came out and spoke about this issue that's happening in these facilities across the state. Um, it's hard because, like you see, a lot of people, they're living with it right now. They have loved ones behind the walls right now that they're scared of death of. They don't know if these loved ones are going to come home. You know, we have examples out here of pictures of people that didn't make it out. We have families that are out here mourning because they just buried their loved one a week or so ago. I mean, this is the reality that people are living with all across the state. And what we're doing is we're asking these elected officials that we put in the office and we put into these positions that share some of the co compassion, that have some compassion and share some of the trauma that these families are going through and some of this hard, some of these pain, the pain that these families are going through but, and create this fund to assist them with that. You know, we're not, this is, this fund is not going to be the answer to everything, but it is going to be a start that let the families know that the, we're coming together as a community to support them and help them through their hardships. And that's all we're asking from the state. We have millions and millions of dollars of surplus money, of COVID money, that's being used for other things all across the state. We're just asking that the powers, the elected officials that we have take under consideration what families and communities are going through and to allocate some of this money to help support the these families. That's all we're asking for. And we're also asking that powers that be really take, a, really put a spotlight on what's happening in these facilities across the state. Because we're hearing countless, account we're hearing countless um, accounts of what's happening in those facilities for months cheshire didn't have heat you know people were left they didn't have no heat and no hot water and this is just one facility across the state other facilities we can talk about the issues in other facilities we're saying close osborne down because they're forcing people to live in deplorable conditions you know we're just not out here talking for our health we're out here because we're scared of situations like this we're scared of having a skin out here again and somebody else dying. You know, we, and that's why we want the fund to be created because at this rate, we know it's almost a reality that somebody else is gonna die behind the walls and we're gonna be here again. We're gonna add, we're gonna, we're about to, we're, after this press conference, we're about to light candles on the street that represent all of the people that died behind the walls. We don't want to have to add to those candles. We don't want to have to be here in another week or month or another day to light another candle because another person died behind the walls. So what we're doing is we're asking everybody, please, we have the petition on the Building It Together CT page and we have it on the Connecticut Bail Fund page, Facebook page. Please go to those, to those Facebook pages. Please fill out the petition. Please support in any way you possibly can leave leave 
when you fill out the petition, we'll have your contact info and we'll keep you up to date with everything that we're doing to support the families behind the families across the state that lost loved ones behind the walls. Um, I want to thank everybody that came out again today, and I thank everybody in advance that will support us in our efforts to get justice for the families. Um, if, does anybody else want to say any parting words? Um, at this moment, I would like to. Um, we're at this moment. We're going to go to the to the corner, and we're going to light the candles and have a moment of silence for everybody that passed away. So. Um, that's the end of this part of the press conference, and we're going to go into the next part. Thank you.